Hello, and welcome to the second in a series of USW CNO webinars designed to assist staff in understanding the variety of government support measures resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we'll be discussing the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. My name is Meg Gingrich, and today I'm joined by Matthew O'Reilly and Guillaume Jacinto from the CNO Research Department. And we also will have Patrick Rodriguez here from D3, who will be around at the end to answer a few questions. Before we begin, I'd like to say on behalf of all of us at the CNO, I hope that everybody continues to hold up as best they can through these difficult times. And if anybody has any ideas for future webinars, contact us at research at usw.ca and we'll post that email at the end of the webinar. So now on to today's webinar. Uh, at the end of March, the government announced that it would be providing a 75% wage subsidy for any business or nonprofit employer that has experienced a major drop in revenue. Of course, there are a number of details that are very important to understand regarding how it will actually work. So we'll go through those today during the webinar. That will be followed by a question and answer section when the presentation is over. And if you have questions that come up during the webinar, please use the question feature. Click the white arrow and the red rectangle to expand out a variety of features. Then you click on the arrow in the right-hand corner of the gray bar labeled questions. And this will give you a screen in which you can type your question. Then you hit enter or send, click send, and I'll be tracking the questions and we'll answer everything that we're able to at the end of the main presentation. We'll also follow up on any questions that we aren't immediately able to answer in the near future. And today, we're also going to be using the poll question feature during this webinar. So we're gonna test this feature out right now uh, with three quick intro questions. So DJ, can you pull up the first poll question? So this is just a simple question. What district do you work in? And please select one, and we'll give you uh, a few seconds here to, to try it out. Okay, I can see the responses coming in. We'll give you about 10 more seconds to answer. Okay, I don't see any more coming in. So DJ, I'll ask you to close the poll. So there you can see the results. We have some representation from District 3, District 6, the CNO. Um, of course, this is in English, so we don't have uh, D5 folks on here right now. Um, so I hope that all worked out well for you. We're going to go on straight to the second poll question. So DJ, can you put that up, please? So the next question is, in your servicing assignment, are any employers already using any of these support programs or measures? Work sharing the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy, negotiating a wage reduction to prevent layoffs, or layoffs and workers applying for CERB or EI, and you can, select, you can make multiple selections. Uh, so we'll give you here a few seconds to fill out the poll. Um, and if there's none that apply to you, you can just just don't answer it. That's fine as well. Um, so we can see the results coming in. I'll give you about 10 more seconds. Okay. Uh, I don't see anything more coming in. So DJ, you can close the poll. Okay, so we see a variety of measures, including work sharing, the wage subsidy, uh, negotiating a wage reduction to prevent layoffs. We see some answers there for that. We hadn't in the previous webinar. Um, and then many of you are dealing with layoffs and relying on then workers have to apply for the uh, CERN or the emergency benefits. Okay, so thanks for that. We have one final poll question to start off. So I will ask CJ to pull that up. Uh, so to the best of your knowledge, how many of your employers are thinking about applying for the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy? And please select one, none of them, one to three, 
four to six, seven to nine, or 10 or more. So we'll give you a few seconds here to answer that. Okay, and see the responses coming in. I'll give about 10 more seconds to provide answers. Okay, uh, I don't see anything else any coming in, so DJ, you can close the poll. Okay, so uh, some people think that the, the employers they deal with will be considering the Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy. Some said none. Um, hopefully with this webinar today, we can help ensure that you and local unions are all aware of this option and that will help. We've seen a lot since the application process opened a few days ago. A lot of employers are applying for it. Um, so this could become an option, and with the details you'll get today, hopefully we'll be able to better deal with it. Um, so we'll bring back these slides. We'll also be asking two other poll questions during today's webinar, but that's it for now. Um, so now to get started, Matthew, can you put up the first slide, please? So just to get things started, um, I wanted to show this chart, which gives a, a visual representation of just how bad the current downturn has been. So this is a change in monthly employment rate over the last 20 years. And in March, we actually saw that 1 million jobs were lost, and that was an all-time monthly record. Um, I would say that women have been hit particularly hard by this uh, set of job losses, as twice as many women have lost their jobs compared to men. Um, and then in this chart, uh, it gives you an idea of how bad it's been compared to past downturns. So if you look right to the edge of the screen, you'll see, uh, or the edge of the slide, you'll see March 2020 and how it compares to the 2008-2009 recession, where we saw at what at that time seemed like a pretty large decrease in employment in a short period of time. You see that there on the slide. And all of this doesn't even fully capture how bad it's been. Uh, April's numbers are sure to be much, much worse than what we've seen just in March alone. So far, close to 7 million people have already applied for the emergency benefits, the CERB or the EI emergency benefits. Um, I think it's clear that the massive, the need for massive state support of workers um, and as important as the emergency benefits are, the steelworkers have argued since the beginning of this crisis that we need to keep workers tied to the labor market as much as possible with as little loss of income as possible. The Canada Emergency Wage Subsidy could help to achieve some of these goals. However, as with many of the support programs, the devil's in the details. Who exactly is eligible, how much of a worker's wage will actually be replaced, and so on. Uh, so to further explain these details of the program, we'll go to Matthew. We'll start with Matthew to, to discuss eligibility. Okay, so over to you, Matthew. All right, thanks, Meg. Um, so the CEWS, it is a wage subsidy. The federal government will reimburse eligible employers for up to 75% of payroll costs, up to a maximum of $847 per week per employee. To be eligible, employers must demonstrate a decline in revenue. In the program, employers need to pay their workers up front and then be reimbursed and the program is administered through the CRA using existing My Business accounts and applications were just opened on Monday, April 27th. The wage subsidy as it currently exists will cover three periods, beginning on March 15th, 2020, and ending June 6th. There are several advantages to a wage subsidy. It is intended to keep workers in their jobs. By doing so, the wage subsidy keeps workers in employer-sponsored benefit plans, it will be easier to restart the economy if companies don't have to rehire their workers. And finally, the amount of money workers are likely to receive is higher if they stay on the payroll rather than getting laid off and being on CERB. The types of employers that could be eligible for the wage subsidy include taxable corporations, nonprofits, including labor unions, registered charities and partnerships consistent of eligible employers. Importantly, employers must have an existing CRA business number as of March 15, 2020, so they must already be in the system. Types of employers that are not eligible is the broader public sector, public universities and colleges, hospitals, crown corporations, municipalities, 
and local governments. So if you are a type of employer that could be eligible, you need to determine if your revenue has declined enough to qualify. This is done by comparing your current revenue against a baseline. And there are two options for a baseline. The first is the corresponding month in 2019. So comparing March 2020 against March 2019. The second option is an average of January and February of this year. So comparing your revenue from March 2020 against the average of January and February 2020. Whichever baseline you choose, however, you have to stick with it. As far as what counts as eligible revenue, you're supposed to use your normal accounting practices. This can be either an accrual or a cash method, and revenue is any normal income from non arm length entities. For nonprofits and charities, they can choose whether or not to include revenue from the government in their calculations. So if you received a big grant from a government agency, you can decide whether that is included in your revenue or not. And to be eligible, employers need to demonstrate a decline in revenue. For the first reference period, that is March 2020, there needs to be a 15% drop in revenue. For the next two periods, there needs to be a 30% drop. However, if you qualify for one period, you are automatically qualified for the following period. The table on the right here shows the different benefit periods and the required revenue reduction in the corresponding reference period. Remember, you have two choices of what your baseline revenue is. So for March, you can either compare against March of last year or an average of January and February of this year. For this first period, you need to have a decline of 15%. If you do qualify for this first period, you automatically qualify for the next. However, you will have to demonstrate a 30% drop in revenue to obtain the wage subsidy in a third period. So you only get one automatic qualification. Now, if an employer de determines their revenue has dropped enough to be eligible, they also need to figure out who are their eligible employees. I want to note here that an employer can use the wage subsidy whether employees are at work or if they're at home on paid leave. An eligible employee is anyone employed by the employer in Canada during the claim period, except if there was a 14-day break in employment where they received no income from the employer. So this is a bit complicated here because it's how the wage subsidy interacts with the CERB. You might recall that the CERB was announced about a week before the wage subsidy. So if an employer laid off a bunch of employees in March and now they want to claim the wage subsidy, they will have to rehire employees and pay them retroactively back to when they were laid off. And they need to do this before applying for the wage subsidy. For workers who were receiving the CERB but are now recalled, if employment income is more than $1,000 during one of the CERB periods, then the individual becomes ineligible for the CERB and will likely have to pay it back. I want to clarify that the situation I am describing here is one where an employee receives their, their normal pay, or at least 75% of it, retroactively to when they were laid off. An employer also needs to determine a worker's eligible remuneration. This is the normal salary, wages, and other taxable benefits employers would normally be required to make payroll deductions on. Severance pay, stock options, and personal use of a company vehicle are not eligible remuneration. And as with revenue, you need to establish a baseline for an employee's pay. And that's going to be an average of their pay between January 1 and March 15th of this year. And finally, there are a few other things to be aware of when applying for the wage subsidy. You might recall one of the first measures announced by the government was a 10% temporary wage subsidy. Well, if you received the 10% wage subsidy, that amount will be subtracted from what you could receive through the CEWS. The CEWS will also be reduced by the amount of any EI work sharing benefits received by employees for the same claim period. And lastly, for employees on paid leave or furloughed, employers can have 100% of the employer portion of CPP and EI reimbursed. For employers in Quebec, this also includes QPP and the Quebec Parental Insurance Plan. 
These amounts are in addition to the portion of employees' wages eligible for a refund. The formula on the right expresses these deductions and additions to the wage subsidy, and that's uh, the factors that employers can consider to determine how much they could receive. So that's an overview of the wage subsidy, and with that, I'll pass it back to Meg. Okay, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, so before we get over to go over to Gio, we're gonna ask one more poll question, or our next poll question. DJ, can you put that up, please? So the question is, in workplaces where there have been layoffs, do you believe workers will be recalled if employers receive the wage subsidy? And you can only select one. Yes, no, some will recall, some won't. Not sure yet. None of the workplaces I service have had layoffs. Okay, so I'll give people a few seconds here to fill that out. Okay, we're seeing some responses coming in. I'll give about 10 more seconds. Okay. Okay, I'm not seeing any other responses coming in, so DJ, you can close the poll. Okay, so uh, we see a mix here in terms of whether you, or not you think uh, employees will be recalled. Um, hopefully this will lead to that happening where applicable. Um, so right now we are gonna go over to Gio, who's gonna talk some more about the subsidy. Okay, so over to you, Gio. Great, thanks, Meg. So the amount of subsidy an employer is entitled to claiming uh, for a specific worker depends on two factors. Uh, the first is whether they are an arm's length or a non-arm's length worker. Without getting into the complicated details, we can assume that an arm's length or arm's length employees are those employees who do not own the business or have a controlling interest in the corporation and are not members of that person's immediate family. Non-arm's length employees are those who own the business, uh, have a controlling interest in the business, or are part of that person's immediate family. So for our purposes here, we'll just be dealing with arm's length uh, employees. The second factor uh, is dependent on when the employee was hired. So for arm's length workers, uh, the subsidy calculation will depend on whether the employee was hired after March 16th, or was a pre-existing employee employed at any time between January 1st, 2020 and March 15th, 2020. So in the case of a pre-existing employee, the amount of subsidy, uh, which you can find in the third column, would be the greater of A or B. A would be determined by whichever is less of 75% of eligible pay paid to the employee in respect of that week or $847. B is determined by whatever is less of 100% of eligible pay paid to the employee in respect of that week or 75% of baseline remuneration in respect of the eligible employee or $847. For new arm's length employees hired on March 16th or after, the formula is much simpler. It is just 75% of eligible pay paid up to a maximum of $847. So to make it a little bit more clear, we can run through an example. Mel is a new employee, and Mel started work on March 16th, 2020, with a weekly salary of $1,200. 75% of 1,200 is 900, which exceeds the max of 847. Mel's employer would therefore be eligible to receive $847 for each week in the claim period. With respect to new employees, those hired after March 16th, the employer would in essence be required to top up. For pre-existing employees, the subsidy calculation amount is a little more complex uh, because there are two scenarios which the formula tries to take into consideration. The first scenario or the first situation uh, is where an employee did not receive uh, or did not experience a wage reduction. The second scenario uh, is one in where the employee has experienced a wage reduction. So we can start with an example here where a worker has not experienced a wage reduction. K 
Kelly's baseline remuneration is the average of her weekly earnings between January 1st and March 15th. After March 15th, her employer did not reduce her wages. So her wages remain the same. Therefore, the $900 weekly average is our starting point. Kelly's employer is entitled to $675 because it is the greater of A and B. In A, 675 is 75% of Kelly's current weekly pay. And as such, it is lower than the 847. In B, 675, which again is 75% is of Kelly's baseline remuneration, is lower than 100% of her full weekly pay and lower than the weekly max of 847. In this case, both A and B, the answer is $675. Now we can look at an example in which there has been a wage reduction. So in this example, Mackenzie's baseline remuneration was $900 a week. After March 15th, Mackenzie's employer reduced her wages by 30% to 630 a week. Mackenzie's employer in this situation would be eligible for a wage subsidy of $630. That is the subsidy would cover the entirety of her weekly salary. So in A, 75% of Mackenzie's current weekly salary is $472.50, and that's 75% of 630. This is lower than the 847 weekly max. In part B, 630, which is 100% of her current weekly pay, is lower than 75% of her baseline remuneration, which would be $675, and lower than the weekly max of 847. As such, the greater of A and B in this case is 630 in B, which is the amount Kelly's employer would be entitled to claim. And so although the example that we, we have in this particular, um, in this particular slide uh, shows a reduction as being caused by an employer re reduction in the wage, uh, the formula, uh, because it works on the basis of a weekly income, uh, would also take into account a reduction of hours. Let me go to the next slide, please. So on the whole, I think the, the wage subsidy program is an appropriate policy to deal with this crisis uh, for the reasons that Matthew and Meg have mentioned. Ensuring workers keep their ties to employers means they can get back to work quicker when economic normality resumes uh, instead of having to look for new work. Uh, a situation which not only has, a, has monetary costs, but psychological ones as well. This is the payoff for workers of a state-funded payroll bailout. However, there are some things which are worth keeping in mind. There is a built-in tendency in the formula to reduce wages by at least 25% for pre-existing employees. So employers can maximize the subsidy amount and not have to top up wages. If used, this will place downward pressure on wages during the crisis and perhaps even after the health aspect of this crisis is over and, economic, and the economic recovery resumes. This is why the USW uh, proposed a mandatory employer paid top up to be included uh, in the wage subsidy scheme. Also, the wage subsidy program does not have any conditions that places limits on executive pay, the payment of dividends, or share buybacks, or the repaying of debts with the payroll savings derived from the subsidy. In effect, the absence of these conditions means eligible firms can use the savings and payroll monies for these items. Uh, again, the USW's list of demands on the wage subsidy included these types of limits. That's back to you, Meg. Okay, thank you so much. So that concludes the main portion of the presentation. Uh, and we're going to open it up to questions in a second. Uh, up on the screen, you'll see the instructions for asking a question. Um, but before we take any, we're going to ask one final poll question. So um, you see that up on the screen there. Uh, so some local unions employ staff. In your servicing assignment, are any local unions considering applying for the wage subsidy? Uh, yes, no, not sure, or no local unions in my servicing assignment employ staff. So we'll give you a few seconds to fill out this poll. Okay, so let's give you about 10 more seconds.
Okay, so I don't see any more responses coming in. So DJ, you can close the poll. Okay, so uh, we have almost 40% uh, of those in attendance who said yes. Um, so that is important to know that local unions that employ staff are potentially eligible for this. Um, so now we are gonna go over to questions. And uh, again, we'll put the instructions back up on the slide, but there's, you can uh, ask questions with the question feature here. And if anybody wants to ask any questions live, you can also indicate that in the chat function um, to just raise your hand or indicate somewhere there that you'd like to ask a live question. Uh, so to start, I'm going to go to a question for Gio. Um, so this is sort of a two-part question. Um, so first, the interaction between the wage subsidy and collective agreements is not entirely clear. Can you comment on what that will look like or what you think that will look like? And then ultimately, how do you think this will affect uh, bargaining power? So Gia, I'll ask you to take that first question. Uh, thanks, Meg. Uh, okay, so on the, on the first question, um, I think the decision to apply for the wage subsidy uh, would obviously fall within, you know, management's rights, right? So that's a traditional sort of uh, part of the scope of management's rights. So, um, so, but but in terms of how this interacts with collective agreements, I think from our perspective. Uh, any negotiation over wage rates, um, employers would have to obviously uh, consult with the union. Uh, and so th there would be no room in an organized workplace for sort of unilateral reduction of, of, uh, of wage rates. So, um, so yeah, that, that would be my answer to the, to the first um, question. Uh, with the second question, I, I don't know if there's an actual clear answer. Um, as I mentioned in my commentary, I think I think in the short term and medium term, uh, because there is a built-in incentive to reduce wages in the formula, uh, this is obviously I think beneficial to uh, employers' bargaining power uh, in terms of their their ability to lower the cost of labor. Uh, and so this effect I think may be felt not just in the short term but also potentially uh, in the long term if it remains in effect uh, in the long term, uh, and that can certainly affect the economic recovery. Uh, on the other side. Um, I think the point of the wage subsidy, as, as you and Matt had, uh, had mentioned, uh, is to keep workers tied to their employers uh, and therefore employed, uh, also at a, a rate higher than they would be getting than on EI. So if, if less workers are unemployed because of this measure, this is generally a benefit for workers as a whole uh, because they're in a better bargaining position when unemployment is low. So I think there's certainly advantages to, to both sides um, with this wage subsidy. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, so I'm gonna go take the next question and ask Matthew to answer it. Um, so this has to do with local unions. Uh, so does a local that's manned by employees on union leave qualify for the wage subsidy? Uh, Matthew. Um, so if I understand correctly, the they're not actually employees of a local union they're um so I, I guess i would say two things if they're um like on long-term leave and they're and they're employees of the local union um then the local union could be eligible for it um but if it's a shorter leave where they're still paid by their employer and they're on a, like a, a buyback thing uh, and they're not employees of the local union then I mean, they're not employees and a local union would not be eligible for the wage subsidy. That, that would be my, uh, my reckoning. Thanks for that, Matthew. And I think that makes sense. Um, and I just want to say again, like if there's any questions here that you want to follow up on or um, where we're not e immediately able to answer, we can always get back to you after and you can reach us at uh, research at USW.ca. Um, so for the next question, I'm going to ask Patrick, 
uh, to come in on this uh, from D3. So we have him, him here from the research department as well. Um, so he's done a lot of work on this and on all the government programs, uh, including work sharing. So I'll ask the next question to him. Patrick, what is the impact of the wage subsidy in a workplace with a work sharing agreement? Uh, Patrick, over to you. Okay, thanks, Meg. So the short answer is workers will generally see a slightly better wage if their workplace uses the work share and the wage subsidy programs than on work share alone. And this becomes increasingly true the larger percentage of the reduction. So the more their hours are reduced, the better wage they're receiving. This has to do with, you may recall from Gio's slides on examples, the way that pre-COVID emergency and post work share wages are calculated. They're averaged over the baseline period. So if you were earning a wage before this happened, the COVID situation unfolded, your workplace went to a work share arrangement, you would see a reduction of your wage. Those two amounts get averaged over the period March, excuse me, January 1st to March 15th. And what that ends up doing is giving you a slightly better wage rate. I won't go into specific amounts at this time, but I will note again that if you do have questions on how to calculate this for any work sites you are uh, representing, servicing, just email us at research, research at usw.ca and we can help you figure that out. There are some variables that can change the calculations slightly and those include when the workplace went on the work share program, if the individual workers have gone on any periods that were seven days or longer of unpaid leave, if, uh, and that's during the baseline period, if they're a new hire or a pre-existing employee and so on. So generally, I just reiterate that it's a better option to go on the wage subsidy and work share program than work share alone. And once again, if you have any questions on specific amount calculations, please just reach out to us and we can uh, give you more than generalizations then. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Patrick. Uh, that was really helpful. Um, so I have another question I'll ask to Gio, and just a reminder if anybody prefers or wants to ask a live question, uh, just to indicate that in the chat function. Um, so for Gio, the next question for you, uh, what happens if an employer doesn't comply with the rules, say they falsely claim to decline in revenue or the money doesn't go to the workers or something along those lines? Uh, Gio. Yeah, so there, there are a few uh, uh, safeguard or, or penalties, um, safeguards or penalties in place. Uh, if, if an employer is, is caught making false statements or omissions in their, in their wage subsidy application, um, they would get, uh, I think it was, it's about a fine of, of 50% of the inappropriate amount being claimed. Um, further, employers can also be fined 25% uh, of, the, of the wage subsidy they applied for uh, or even have their applications denied if it's found that they've uh, engaged in any transactions or events uh, that have the effect of artificially reducing the revenues so that they actually qualify for the program. So things like um, uh, closing a store for a number of days without really any valid justification for shutting down production. Um, those types of, of measures that would be uh, not normal uh, or, or abnormal. Um, also, the bill also provides, like the, the Minister of Finance in this case, with the power to communicate to the public um, in any manner that the Minister uh, deems appropriate. Uh, the name of any person uh, who submits a, a wage subsidy application. And so, um, this is what we could call essentially a, a name and shame mechanism um, for employers whom the government considers uh, to have not acted honorably, uh, including those who may have found ways to skirt uh, the anti-abuse measure. So uh, I just add on that particular item um, that was one of the that was one of the elements or one of the uh, safeguards that um, the USW had pushed uh, and other progressive organizations as well. Uh, which we had proposed and which we pushed for uh, as a condition of introducing the wage subsidy scheme. 
Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, so we have another question here. I'm going to ask Matthew to answer it. Um, how do we know if an employer has applied? Does the local have the right to know? Uh, Matthew. Yeah, um, that's a very good question. Uh, we only have partial information about this. There is something in the legislation that says that at the minister's discretion, they can uh, reveal the names of the applicants uh, for the for the program. So I, I believe Gio talked about like a name and shaming mechanism. Uh, so there is something in the legislation that the minister can disclose this information. Now, exactly what the mechanics of that are, uh, we don't know at the moment. So we don't know if that's a freedom of information request or if there will be a portal or, or if all the information will just be published. Um, and again, what exactly that information amounts to. So the amounts of the subsidy received, whether wage reductions happened. Um, we don't know the details of what information will be shared or how it will be shared, though there is a provision in the legislation that there's a power to share the basic information. Okay, thank you for that, Matthew. Um, yeah, so I mean, I think with this whole thing, there's still a lot of details that we're to not totally clear on and things that we still need to push for, which we'll, we'll continue to do, of course. Um, we have a few minutes left. I don't see any other questions coming in. I'm just going to turn my webcam back on here. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, but if anybody does have any final questions, please go ahead and ask or indicate uh, that you'd like to ask a live question. Um, in the meantime, while we wait to see if anything else comes in, uh, Matthew, maybe you can put up the last slide. Um, so if you do want any more information uh, that's up to date, you can always visit the website at usw.ca slash COVID-19. And if there's anything that you think of after this webinar, um, you can always uh, reach us at research at usw.ca or if there are any other ideas for future webinars. Um, and we'll also be sending out the slides to everybody who's here today and some useful links as well. Um, so if I don't see any more questions come in, I don't see anybody wanting to ask a live question. So um, with that, I think I will just wrap things up. Um, I'd like to thank all of the presenters today, Matthew, Gio, um, as well as Patrick for all of the work that you've done on all of this. I think it was really, really useful for everybody. Um, also thanks to DJ uh, and our IT folks behind the scenes and to Adrian. Um, you will be receiving a follow-up evaluation form with four questions on it for you to fill out. Uh, so with that, again, I hope everybody found this useful and helpful today. And uh, with that, I will say thank you and bye to everybody. Thanks. Okay, I think that's everybody except uh, Alex, who is uh, a member of the club anyway. Oh, Alex has a question. Oh, Alex says, Hi. good job. <laughs> um, which I agree. Uh, I, you know, that was uh, once again, 
flawless. Um, but why don't we do a round of comments and maybe